Uh, let's. We're rolling. Okay, this is a home interview, Honey Eye Falls, Monroe County, New York, 22nd of August 2005. It is approximately 2 p.m. The interviewers are Wayne Clark and Mike Russert. Could you give me your full name, your date of birth, and place of birth, please? William Mantegna. I was born August 19, 1918. And where were you born? In Rochester, New York. Okay. Um, what was your uh, background, your school, how much schooling did you have before you entered service? Well, I graduated from high school and had one year of postgraduate. Okay. So I couldn't go to college, I didn't have any money. <laughs> Do you remember where you, um, well, you were drafted, you said, by the Army? Yeah. Um, May 1941? March. 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 Okay. Uh, you were taken to Fort Niagara, you said? Fort Niagara. And what did you do there? Well, they gave us tests, and they test us, and, and uh, after a while, they said, that you'll be, they kept us there about six weeks. We were taking these different tests. And uh, we didn't know why or what for, but then when that was all over with, we were told that we all qualified for the Air Corps, because they were looking for people with the Air Corps. Mm -hmm. And that was all fine, and the morning that we were going to tell us where we were going to go, we read the paper, and there it says, you won't get out in one year, you'll be you're, you're tied in for three years. And none of us signed up. And the major was, and you know what the major said to me? I can't believe it. He said, you guys aren't going to get out in one year because we'll be at war by that time. Huh. I'll never forget that. But none of us signed up. And he sent us all to Fort Belvoir, Virginia. Uh -huh. And from that group, after the war started, most of those guys went into the Air Corps because they already had their information. Uh -huh. I refused to go. I, I like being an engineer. Okay, um, so how long were you uh, in, in Virginia? Well, I was in... Fort Belvoir uh, from, uh, well, six weeks, I guess it was May, May until uh, then the war started in 41, and uh, we left Fort to Belvoir, and I went to Plattsburgh, New York. Okay, so you were there when Pearl Harbor happened? Oh, yes. I was, it was the same morning I was heading to Furlough to come home. Uh -huh. um, do you remember, how, how did you learn about Pearl Harbor? Well, I had my furlough and I went down to Washington, D.C. at the Union Station to go home. An MP came up to me and he says, Soldier, you got a pass. I said, yeah, I'm going in on furlough. He says, no, you're not. There's a bus up front, get on it, we're at war. That's how I found out. Mm -hmm. Did you have any reaction? How did you feel when you found out that the Japanese had attacked Pearl Harbor? Well, of course, at that time I didn't know too much about mm -hmm. it. It wasn't until I got back to camp and we found right. out the details. Mm -hmm. and of course, that changed everybody's attitude, you know. Mm -hmm. All right, after you uh, were there, where did you, where were you assigned? No, I, I, yeah, I, was, re I was assigned to this photo mapping unit. Okay. And I did that, and I told you, because I had stereoscopic vision, I didn't know it, but I could, are you familiar with the mosaics that they, mm -hmm. well, I was doing that, and I could do it, the guys couldn't believe it. And then from there, I was with a special unit, and we were sent to Plattsburgh, New York, and we were surveying the east coast from Plattsburgh and another other part of outfit from Florida up. This is with the aerial maps? Aerial maps, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, while I was in Plattsburgh, <clears throat> and I told you, uh, being I was a corporal of the guard, this would happen. You know, I always say, you don't, <laughs> you never volunteer in the Army. <laughs> well, it was a cold. Then I was on guard duty, and it was so cold up there, instead of having the fellows out there for two hours, four hours, we had them up there two hours. I'd go and post a guard. Mm -hmm. So the Sergeant Campbell at the headquarters company, he was talking, he said, damn the major. And that's what's the matter, Campbell. And he said, oh, he wants these things, he wants them perfect. I can't make any races. Well, I said, you know, I can type. I said, let me try it. Well, to make a long story short, I was typing, and uh, Campbell was out checking the guard, and pretty soon I felt somebody touch me in the back, and it was the major. He says, uh, Lieutenant, the, or something, he says, Corporal, he says, where did you learn to type like that? I said, well, in high school. I was editor of the newspaper. Well, he says, fine. He says, uh, have you read the bulletin board? Yeah, I do. He says, what did it say? And I told him what's on it. He says, and I also said, you're looking for clerks. He said, why aren't you reported? 
Well, I said, I'm not a clerk. I don't think about being a clerk. He said, do you know what clerks do in the Army? I said, no, sir. He said, they type. <laughs> so I reported back to him the next day, and I said to him, I don't want to be a clerk. I'd rather be with the outfit. He said, look, soldier, you take orders, you, you report here 900 hours, which I did. So I was doing the typing. About a month later, more than, yeah, more than a month later, uh, I posted it. He says, did you post the notice on the board you know, the night before we did it? I said, yes, sir. He said, did you read it? I said, sure. He said, you, you're aware that there, uh, anybody with a, with a high school uh, graduate with an average of 85 or over can apply for officer's candidate school? I said, yeah, but I, said, I don't want to do it. He said, why not? I said, well, for three reasons. It says there you got to have 35 hours to buy your uniforms when you transfer from there to the school, plus $250 to buy your uniform. I said, I don't have that kind of money. He said, well, can your parents help you? I said, no way. I said, I, said, I couldn't raise $150 to go to college back a year ago. Well, anyway, so a week later he come in and he says, if you'll take the test and pass it, I'll buy your uniform and I'll raise you from a corporal to a tech sergeant, which paid $75 a month. And in four months, I'd have $300. Okay, so I said, I'll, I'll go. And we took the test, it was different in oral tests and written tests. And I think there was 14 of us that passed. And some of these guys were college graduates, two-year college people, so forth. And three of us made the grade or the thing. But then when they could give us the physical, two guys, one guy had a night blind, the other guy had a heart murmur. So I was the only guy that ended up going to officer school. Well, I went through officer school, got out of there. Now, where was that? Fort Belvoir, Virginia. Oh, it was back to Virginia, okay. Virginia. So I knew the place, so mm -hmm. it helped a lot. Well, I graduated from there. Um, I asked this one man, this one man, he says, are we going to be assigned to the outfit that, he says, soldier, or he didn't call you, he said, mister, we have trained you and it cost us $30,000. Do you think we'll send you someplace else? You'll go where you're trained. Well, I says, fine. Well, believe it or not, I end up in Camp Joseph Robinson in Arkansas with a colored camp up there. And I trained colored troops for three months. And then they sent me down to Camp Claiborne, Louisiana, where we trained reserve officers, you know, fellows out of civilian life. And they, uh, I remember one fellow, in fact, this colonel, he was in charge of the port, and his, his uh, family owned a boat business in St. Louis. Well, anyway, uh, so then I ended up in the port of Oran working with these uh, unloading ships. Now, how did you get over there? Well, we went over on a, on a troop ship. On a troop ship, okay, oh. in, in a convoy? Convoy, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, so I was assigned to the uh, working the port, and again, it was me and another uh, uh, officer. He was a quartermaster officer. I'm an engineer officer. They sent the quartermaster officer to an engineer depot and sent me, an engineer officer, to the quartermaster depot. <laughs> so I tried to argue with the major. He says, look, sir, young fellow, he says, get out of here before I... So you don't argue with the major, right? That's... So I was with a colored outfit, working the port for 16, for uh, six months. Now, is this the same unit that you were with in Arkansas, or is it a, no, it's no. a different? No, we no. We were 25 of us just, uh -huh. just uh, we were what we call uh, uh, reserve, you know, officers to, to fill in. Uh -huh. We were assigned over there. The make difference what outfit you belong to, they signed, just assign you. So right. I, I was assigned to uh, the uh, quartermaster outfit, and we worked in a part of our end. Now, what were your duties there? Well, we worked 24 hours a day, and I, I was in charge. Of, I'd have one, one platoon, anywhere from 36, sometimes 80 men. We were assigned a ship to unload. We'd unload all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. And B and I was an engineer officer and had training, and, and I used to unload all heavy equipment, tanks, uh, locomotives, all heavy heavy equipment. We used to train each fellow because uh, in our group, our, our, our men were trained like to, to operate the winches in the ship. Now, we worked at night, and all I'd done was the hand signals. All you had a little light, so when they brought up a tank from the hole and brought it over, dropped it off the side of the ship, 
and that's that was one of the jobs. The other job was all over any kind of equipment, food supplies, uh, clothing, anything that we needed to work, ammunition, a lot of ammunition. You know, clusters of the 75 shells or three uh -huh. in a cluster. Day in, day out, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Now, how long were your relations with the, the, the black soldiers? I got along very good, because yeah, my job was to, they, they signed me this job, and, and uh, no, I, I got along with them very good. I never knew much about colored troops, but I got along very good with them. And uh, we, because uh, the guys are very, you know, proud of their units, especially when they're in a group like guys that were trained to, to unload the equipment and run the winches, because these guys had to be trained to do that. And that was a day in, 12 hours a day. Seven days a week, I mean, we'd work two shifts. Okay, um, how long did you work in the port of Iran? 21 months. 21 months, okay. Well, uh, with other times, we convoy supplies. Now, I don't know if you gentlemen are aware, uh, when they were fighting in Tunis, and of course we had the big depot in, in Iran, we convoy supplies across the desert, 1,500 miles. And uh, I went on several of those. We had depots. 300 miles apart, we'd bring supplies to one and they'd leapfrog them to another. Did you ever have any contact with the enemy at all? Oh yeah, we got strafed, sure. Uh-huh. And one of those trips, we uh, <coughs> were going to one camp, we were almost there, and uh, we saw smoke in the sky, and I didn't like it, so we, we dispersed our trucks. I had, I had 50 trucks and 60 men, and me and a sergeant went in, uh, the camp and the, the uh, Germans had raided the uh, depot. We didn't find any American bodies, luckily, but they destroyed the camp, took the stuff, and now, believe it or not, we didn't have walkie-talkies. So for 17 days, we we hid ourselves around there, not knowing if they guys make a raid on us. Well, we were running. We ran out of food the third day, and we are running out of water. And on the 17th, the morning of the 17th, we heard motors running, and me and a sergeant, and luckily it was an American patrol. And with their help, and we got back to camp. And in that ordeal, we lost one man, and I, I lost 30 pounds in 17 days. Huh. Now, were your drivers uh, black soldiers, too? Yeah, or? Mm -hmm. all black. Yeah. I, was, uh -huh. I was the only white person there. Okay. Now, at that point, had you picked up the supplies, or were you...? Well, our they... trucks were loaded. We didn't lose our supplies. We went back to base, uh -huh. back to Iran. We are 300 miles away. But, uh, you know, we, 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 convoys were going all the time. We had three routes across the desert, one along the coast, one on the interior, another one farther in. Are you familiar with the salt flats in North Africa? I've heard miles, of them. I've heard of them. 60 miles wide and 200 miles long? We, we'd go across some of that. But we had a different rules. Of course, once we got control of the skies, it wasn't too bad. But at first, you know, we got strafed, even in the port. Sometimes we had more casualties in the port than we had uh, than the people on the front line. Mm -hmm. Now, here's another thing. A lot of people are, are you gentlemen aware of how many troops in the background to support one man on the fighting front? You know I know I've sure? heard the figure. I, I can't remember what it is. For every man in front of the line, there was nine of men behind to bring up the supplies and do the rest of the stuff. A lot of people are, have no idea about that. Of course, you know the term, we were called the grunts. I don't know if you know that or not, but I hated that word. But we were the grunts. Yeah, we took a lot of casualties, especially, you know, accidents in the port. Now, did, did you get bombed in the port, too, oh, or yes, just straight? Many times. I come close to getting killed twice. <clears throat> now, was, was it strictly American ships you unloaded? or well, All American, yeah. Okay. One part of the port, uh, we, we turned over to the French. And are you familiar with Merzel Kabir? No. Well, that's where the French foreign, the French fleet was sunk. They, they sunk the fleet, the fleet. Nine miles out of Iran, that was the uh, French uh, port for their, uh, for their navy. Mm -hmm. And they... All the ships were down. All the, all the masters, you can still see them. And, uh, and then we, when we turned a lot of stuff over to the French, they had part of the port. And 
There were 10,000 Italian prisoners working the port at that time, and uh, uh, 2,000 French troops and uh, 2,000 civilian troops. I mean, not troops, but people were working the port. Mm -hmm. Did everybody get along, or were there oh, yeah. problems? Well, what happened, we worked our own section, the French worked in their own section, and the civilians in another section. Mm -hmm. Did you ever have many uh, encounters or meetings with the French at all? Or? Oh yeah, all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, I met one fellow there who was in charge of the civilian labor. This guy spoke French, he spoke Italian, he spoke Arabic, and Spanish. Hmm. So, since I was able to speak the language with him, uh, we were able to converse and help each other out when we needed something. So. Did you have any problems with uh, black marketing or thievery going on, or? Yeah, you know, not so, not so much with um, uh, see the colored troops. Nothing. These guys were all um, serving time when I was with. Three months, six months, to twelve months for hard labor. So these were convicts from the United States? Well, they were guys who had committed crimes in the Army. Mm -hmm. Oh, in the Army? In the Army, yeah. No, they weren't convicts. They were guys who had committed oh, differently okay. in the Army. Mm -hmm. So they made them stevedores as part of well, their punishment? Well, they were, the idea, they were, they were assigned to hard labor uh -huh. for three months, six months. So we got guys coming in and going out all the time. I see. <clears throat> we never talked too much about that because, but the guys that, most of I say, 95 percent were guys that got in trouble. Were young guys, and uh, we had a few hardcore guys that eventually got rid of. Mm -hmm. No, you've got to realize when the guys are working 12 hours a day, seven days a week, no time off. Sometimes we get a half day off, and uh, then. It would take us an hour to get to the port and back to, to base. So it was 14 hours a day they were going, and then they had the rest of the time to, for themselves at camp. They couldn't go nowhere. If they went out of camp, they got picked up. They got, got more time. Now, did you keep them under guard or anything? Or no, yeah, they would guard we. Well, we had a cadre of uh, of uh, black sergeants that were not hadn't committed any crime. Uh -huh. These guys were, were, were good. They're, they were like MP, but they were part of our outfit, and they guarded the camp. Yeah. The other guys would sneak out, they'd steal each other's blankets and try to sell them to the Arabs. They'd get caught, and then they'd get 30 days in the, in the bird cage. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm talking about? A bird cage is a barbary outfit, 8 by 10. They put them in there for on bread and water for three days, or as much as 30 days. That's all the punishment they got. But it didn't happen too much. Uh -huh. Once they got a taste of spending time in the birdcage, they didn't like that. Uh -huh. But some would sneak out. They'd go to, to the, they go AWOL, and the MPs would pick them up a week later, and then they were sent to another camp. Now, were they paid? Oh yeah. yeah. They received regular military pay or pay everything else? Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, no? no? see, they were in the war zone. If they were in the states, they wouldn't get paid. Uh -huh. Well, they worked hard. I'm telling you, that was you know, 12 hours a day, man. That was and that was physical labor. Was there any forms of entertainment like uh, visiting U.S. Well, shows? Well, most of the guys used to like to gamble. They get their pay and they play cards and dice. Mm -hmm. And some that we had horseshoes, and once in a while we get a movie. We had a place where we had a movie for the guys. Did you ever get USO show come, shows come no, in? Never, no, no. I never saw a US show. All the time was over there. Never saw one. All right, after your, uh, you said you were doing that for about 21 months, where did you go from there? Well, in North Africa. Yeah. Uh, well, we went, went across the Mediterranean. We uh, uh, were bringing supplies and made invasions of of the uh, Corsica, Sardinia, Sicily, Anzio, back to North Africa, and then the, the last one was across the Mediterranean, southern France. We went from from Marseille to Toulouse, all the way up north. Mm -hmm. Now, were you involved in the invasions? Oh yes, definitely. I got a map here. I'll show you.
Now, were you um, involved with the, the Italian prisoners before or after you were involved in the invasions? Oh, before. before. Yeah, I, I was with the colored outfit for six months, and, and uh, I was over there 21 months altogether, and 13 months with the Italians. Uh -huh. I can tell you a lot of stories about the Italian prisoners. What are some of the stories you could tell us about the Italian prisoners? Now, where were they kept? In, in, a, in, a, in a base camp about seven miles out of Oran. In a regular base camp there. We had everything. You know what? With 4,000 prisoners, we had all kinds of people. We had, we had doctors, we had lawyers, we had uh, college professors, uh, architects, engineers, all kinds of guys. And they were all basically doing uh, stevedore work? Right. Now, you were assigned to them because you spoke Italian. That's right. Yeah. I was the only second lieutenant that was in command of a regiment. You know, like that. Hmm. Other, they had two other camps. They had the major and they had the eight, eight uh, you know, four captains and eight lieutenants running the camp. And I, me and one other uh, cor um, lieutenant ran the Italian camp. And I, I was the biggest camp. We had 4,000 prisoners. They had three. Now this is, you said you were in the uh, um, 6829 uh, POW administration company, yeah. is that what this was? You got that down there? You wrote it down a piece of paper to us, okay. yes. Yeah. Yeah. I got I got my record, they're here. Very quickly, uh, this, this will, you can't see it here, but we, we, I ended up right here between Toulouse and Marseille. We went all the way up the Rhone Valley and... Uh, we went in Epinal, and then, uh, of course, that was the, when I went home from there. But this was in uh, uh, Heidelberg, Ludwigshafen, and all that area is where, where it was in there. When the war ended, we had 185,000 German prisoners in Ludwigshafen, and I'll tell you about that. Now, uh, you said these prisoners, um, you used them to as, as longshoremen to load and unload supplies? Well, well you for a lot of things. Uh, uh, well, let me tell you, here's where the camp, when I, when I was uh, told to go to that, to that camp, uh, working with the prison wasn't working out too well because they only had an Italian or um, an American sergeant who spoke the language, but the prisoners the, the Italian cadre of 265 officers, I don't know why they had that many there, were controlling the camp, and uh, this one professor, Major Ashoni, he was a professor of English in the University of Rome. He spoke excellent English. In fact, I told him one time, I says, we would spot you in a minute. He says, why so? I said, because your English is not American. <laughs> well, anyway, so um, I was sent to the camp, the uh, colonel assigned me, assigned me to a, a captain, and he filled me in on the rules of uh, the Geneva Convention, the whole thing, what, so I would know that. Well, I was in camp for uh, 14 days, two weeks, and I reported back, and I said to the colonel, the problem is these people don't understand, and the officers are taking control, and, and the poor soldiers, you know, the average soldier, was getting a short deal. They weren't getting enough to eat. And you're working these guys. So he said, what do you recommend? Well, I said, well, first of all, I says, you've got to feed these people better than you feed them if you're going to work them when you do it. So then uh, after two weeks, in came the, uh, the colonel and his aide and his major Brassy who was in charge. He was an artillery officer. And he didn't like it at all. He never went outside or talked. He talked all through with the Italian sergeant, or with the American soldiers who spoke Italian. So they were leaving, put me in charge. I didn't know that was going to happen. Well, for five more days, I didn't let them know that I spoke the language. So I could hear what was going on. Mm -hmm. And the big thing was, of course, with food. And what happened, I don't know why they had 265 uh, Italian officers there. And uh, so 
I, uh, opened, when I was there, the, this major, he put me in charge of the kitchen. That's how I found out there wasn't enough food for the guys. So, uh, when I took over, I said to the, uh, said the American sergeant, didn't know I spoke Italian yet either. I said, Sergeant, I says, why are these guys food? And, well, that's for the officers. I said, you got to be kidding. These guys eat deluxe meals and the poor guys working just on, on soup. So, I said, from now on, I said, tell the guys that the officers eat the same food as the men do. Well, there was a big outcry. And, and uh, so, after the second day, we, I had the food brought like the, for the soldiers had. So they, they, they were saying, tell, he said, tell the lieutenant, we're officers, we're entitled to the stuff. So I said to the sergeant, let me explain to him. So I made my speech up. And I tell you, mister, if you want to see a room go quiet, it went down and I explained to him in their own language what was going to happen. So we had four big kitchens. I'll show you a picture of them. So I went to each kitchen. Of course, it wasn't until the next morning the whole camp knew I spoke Italian. So uh, after... And these guys come to me, you know, we're officers, we're entitled to this. And I said, look, I know all about the Geneva Convention. You are, you've got no special privileges. And besides, I said, you volunteered to come work for the Americans, and you are, you are being paid, and uh, that stuff doesn't go. Well, anyway. Now, were the officers paid the same amount as the enlisted men? Yeah, they were paid the same. They all paid the same. You know what an, what an Italian soldier used to get in, in the Italian Army, a private? $350 no. a, a month. We were paying them 80 cents a day, $24 a month. So those guys, and you know, we had a problem. If these guys were sick, they didn't want to go and work them, but we didn't dock them if he was sick. Anyway, so anyway, so I was having trouble with them, so um, it was the Italian major, he <laughs> spoke good English. I sat down with him, and I said, I want to make a list of uh, officers for each battalion, each company. And another thing that I found out there, that a lot of those guys bought their rank. I mean, their family had money, and even the sergeants. So these guys were had never even went through, you say, basic training. Mm -hmm. So through the uh, major and through uh, an Italian officer that was very good and helped me out a lot, we 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 replaced all regular army officers and, and, and uh, sergeants in charge of each battalion, okay, and company. So when I announced that the officers were going to leave, they didn't want to leave. So I had a hotline. I called the port. They sent up a bunch of MPs. And I said, you guys are going to 131. Well, now, 131 was one of these big holding camps. That's all it was. They were fed twice a day. They didn't do any work. You know how many, you, you know how many Italian prisoners we had in North Africa? No. 270,000. Wow. And 70,000 German prisoners. So we had holding camps all over the place. Uh -huh. Are you aware that we, they sent a lot of the Italian prisoners to, to America here? I, I knew they sent some, well, and I knew they, they sent some Germans. Have so. them here than bring food over there. Uh -huh. Well, anyway, after I got rid of the guys, and I got on the microphone and told the guys in camp that what the rules were, and he, after I explained to him, I, I told the, uh, oh, the uh, Italian major, he used to tell the guys, remember now, you're Italian soldiers, let's not go overboard and working with the Americans. Of course, he thought I was going to get rid of him, so I, I kept him. Cause, and uh, also, when I first got there, there's one lieutenant, he was an engineer officer, and he, say, he said to the sergeant when I got to the gate, you know, he gave me a salute. And he said to the other guy in Italian, another stupid American, they sent us. Well, I remember the little guy, and when I got rid of the officer, he was one of them that, when I told him about the food, you know, and I said, you, I says, you may think we're stupid, but you're the guys behind the wire, and I'm not. <laughs> well, anyway, I kept him and his major. Well, they both worked very good for me, and the whole crew in a totally different situation. But that's what we did day in, day out, seven days a week. We tried to give them time off, you know. We'd send down anywhere from 1,800 to 2,000 men a day uh, to, to a shift. Now, do you know logistics of providing food for 4,000 people three times a day? I imagine. I used to make up 14 reports a day for all this stuff. 
motor pool full of food. And, and, uh, now, were the cooks American or were they oh, Italian? No, Italian? Italian. Italian. So, I was the so only, the whole camp basically ran? I had 28 enlisted men and, and one of the lieutenants. The rest was all Italian. They, they, we set the orders and the rules and they followed them. Was it mostly Italian uh, food they served, or did they serve American Oh, no, it wasn't shop? American. Well, they, they, I can tell you a lot of stories about uh, how they, they, were, they had some darn good cooks. You, you gentlemen hear about the Feast of St. Joseph? I know, right. it's it's a very sacred yeah, okay. time in the church So they came to me and they said, well, Italy. Is, it, is it possible to get some extra flour so we could make uh, noodles for the Feast of St. Joseph? I said, well, I don't know. Because I had pretty good contact down the port. And when I when I asked for something, I usually got it. So I was able to get the flour and powdered eggs and the whole thing. And I'll show you a picture. They made a thousand pounds of noodles for the Feast of St. Joseph. And then they said to me, having a Feast of Joseph without wine, he says, that's not good. <laughs> of course, there's all kinds of wineries over there, but you know, the American troops weren't supposed to get it. So I didn't know what to do. So I went to one of the wineries and, and I talked to the guys, and they didn't want money. They wanted either gasoline or stuff like that. That was against the rules to do. But anyway, I took a chance, and I got 200 gallon casks of wine. So everybody had a pint of wine for the Feast of St. Joseph. <laughs> but see, things like that raised the morale. Mm -hmm. And then another time, with my men, we were playing uh, football, touch football. And one guy came to me, and he spoke good English. He says he was a he'd been in the United States, and he was a uh, coach. And he said, could you, get, could you get us some soccer balls? I said, sure. So we made a soccer field, and the guys played soccer. And I finally got them uh, musical instruments. We had, we had one guy that sang in La Scala. And we got a picture of him. We called him the voice. Boy, could that guy sing. And that's what we entertained. And they put on plays for, them, mm -hmm. for themselves. Did you ever have anyone try to escape? They didn't dare, because a Frenchman ever caught them on camp. They uh, killed them. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can tell you one story about that. Two of our guys... Uh, got out of camp and they damn near got killed as we hadn't caught him in time. Oh, yeah. Frenchmen, they, they'd kill him in a minute. They, they were death against him. So, um, after you left North Africa, what, what did well, you do? Then what, what happened, uh, since uh, we were with prisoners, they formed a unit of uh, uh, of officer it was uh, five officers and uh, I think it was 32 enlisted men, and our job was to build uh, holding camps on the mainland when we went over. So I, I was the engineer officer in charge of that, and, and another fellow. Well, I, uh, now's the time. Well, wait, let me show you these pictures. So I, uh, I can go by that. And I, 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 I can turn the camera. Okay. When I got to the camp, another thing, the they were all sleeping on the ground with a, a straw tick. And I said to Neil, you can't have you guys sleeping on the ground all the time. So in the port of Oran, there was a lot of dunnage. You know what that was? That was lumber they'd put between gas and oh, guns. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I went down to requisition that, and I put the guys to work making bunks. So two guys, and we, we had, let's see, two, four, six, eight, ten guys in the tent instead of sleeping on the ground. Well, that was a big, a big morale booster. So then for myself, I did this myself, the president helped me some, and there is my quarters at the camp. And on top of that is the army tent. Wow. Well, I had running water, I had, I had running water, I had a fireplace, electric light, and we all had electric light. I, I got a hold of a, of a uh, British uh, electrical unit, so we had lights in each tent. Now oh, this all over the top that's... Kind of painted scenes on it as a tent. Scenes of the New York skyline. Mm -hmm. The guy that painted my picture painted all that. Wow. Okay. I'm pretty proud of that. Yes. Now later on we made a little settee. The guys made the frame and we I upholstered it with some seats we got from salvage.
Where's the little guy that sang La Scala? Boy, what a voice he had. We call him the voice. See? No, he's an Italian POW. We all yell, you know. <clears throat> okay. Did you ever go back there after the war? No, never went back. Now there's a picture in Paris. I, I spent three days in Paris after the war ended. Here's one of my captains. This guy was from Seattle. He was six foot eleven inches tall. Uh, that's him in this side, and this is you. Me, yeah. Okay. This is him. That's the captain. Where was he from? Seattle, Washington. I got in contact, in touch with him after the war. He's dead now. And here's. The day that the prisoners made, made oh. my picture, I was 25 years old, and there's my the, my birthday gift. Okay, oh. we'll have to go in and, and show that on the tape. Yes. I'll hold on to this, and okay. we'll show it next to the, well, if you don't mind. Now, this is, this is the list men I was showing you. We were in charge of, like that. of that uh, group, and those boys and myself, and we were, that was our job was to guard those trailers. Uh, what kind of machine gun is that? Well, that's a, a, 50, a 30 caliber machine gun, but we had it, we, I mean, a 20, 20 caliber machine. But uh, inside we had, we had a, a rifle barrel, that was a training thing. Yeah, it's quite a barrel on that, huh? Yeah. I've never seen well, that was the, what do you call that, the, the 20, 20 millimeters. But we, we used to shoot 30 caliber shells because they had a barrel inside of it. Yeah, here's another, another picture of that, of the guys. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Now, here's a fellow that I was with all, uh, when we got to the mainland, we called him Big George. Six foot three, 275 so. pounds. Big George. And that's you on the left, yeah. or the right, I'm sorry. Oh. Am I being recorded? Yes. Yes. Okay, yes. Now, there's Big George, and i got to tell you why I got that picture. One night, we were up in this building cleaning our pistols and so forth, and all of a sudden, George said, George, what the hell are you doing? He said, well, there's a mouse over there. <laughs> if he didn't hit the mouse, it died of fright, I'm sure. <laughs> but imagine putting seven forty-five caliber shells in that closet. He fired seven shots at it. The whole pistol. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, now we're talking about being on the mainland, okay? Yes. All right, now. Now, when did you go over to the mainland? Oh, in, in August, early August. Of 40... So, well, yeah, when the invasion started in, in, uh, in uh, June, and we went, we made the invasion in August. That was a special unit that was, and I was in charge of the building the camp. Now... There's me in a picture. He's a little Frenchman. He was a prisoner, but he was a, um, he spoke, he was in, in, he's in Alsace, so he was French, but he spoke excellent German, and I freed him and another uh, okay. German soldier, and I used him as my interpreter because I could speak French very well, and he spoke French, so I used him in, in the mainland for a lot of things. I can tell you stories about that. Now, he's a French soldier? Yeah, he was a French soldier, but he was he was a prisoner of the Germans. Oh, okay. But so, in fact, he spoke, and he used to, he was a chauffeur for a lot of German officers in Ludwigshafen. So, yeah. So you basically followed behind the front, and you set up POW well, holding yeah, when, camps. Well, when uh, we started off from Marseilles up, our mm -hmm. first big battle was in Avignon. And we set up a first camp there. And then we turn that over to another outfit and we move up with the army, all the way up the Rhone Valley. How close were you behind the front lines? Oh, well, sometimes we're close enough to sometimes the shells landed in our area, mm -hmm. the artillery. Mm -hmm. So you just followed behind the front and you just set up these holding camps right. for POWs. Well, here's my cadre of uh, some of my sergeants that were with me at this. At this, uh, that was when we were in, in, uh, uh, in the mainland. Okay. Here's a 
picture of some of the devastation of the cities. I don't now, have anything written on the back of that. Somewhere. This is in France or France, Germany? Yeah. France? Okay. How many camps would you say you set up? Avignon, Dijon, Epinal. One more in between there. I think four. Four altogether. Mm -hmm. We have as many as 5,000 prisoners, 2,000 prisoners, all depends. There's a... I won't talk right now, I just want to show you these pictures, okay? Okay. Well, you can talk about the pictures too, well, though, as you show them. Read, look in the back of that, that tells you I wrote in the back okay. of that. This is the Opera Building... In Paris. In Paris, a quartered... Uh, oh, and the Rue Lafayette. Lafayette. Okay. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Did you get it? Right. I got it. This is a uh, area that the army, our Air Corps, bombed in in France. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Read the back of that. What does it say in the back of it? So, oh, this says Germany, 1945. Uh huh. Okay, this is part of Germany then, where the Army Air Corps bombed. Now these are the four cooks in charge of each of the, uh, one, one in charge of the uh, uh, kitchen for each of the battalions. And that's where we, they made the thousand pounds of Italian noodles for the Feast of St. Joseph. Okay, so this is back in North Africa. Yeah. So for the Feast of St. Joseph, they're... Okay, and that's all the noodles, huh? They're all the noodles. Okay. <laughs> Right now, this is back in North Africa. I want to show you something. Now, you see that picture there? Now, you remember we had 4,000 prisoners, and our biggest problem was getting water and to bathe these guys, you know. So, we had a couple of the tanks, and the way water could come down, we could wash our clothes. So, one day, I always used to wash my uh, underwear, and we walk around with our, in our shorts. So I was washing my clothes, and there was two Italian prisoners over there, and let me tell you about the conversation. These two guys were saying, boy, he said, you know, being prisoners of the Americans is like being in paradise. Now, this is all in Italian, of course. And he says, they feed us well, they treat us good, and man, he says, being like in paradise. So he got up door, he says, are you new here? I said, yeah, I've only been here a month and a half, because, you know, we get pretty in and out. So they asked, where are you from? So, I mean, I can speak Italian. I knew where my parents come from. I told them where my parents came from and all that. I said, oh, you come there. And uh, they expected And just about that time, my sergeant came. <laughs> he said, Lieutenant, they want you at headquarters. And these guys almost died because they didn't know that I was the <laughs> camp commander. Because you see, being dressed like that, how can they mm -hmm. tell? Yep. <laughs> that was quite a... And the guys, they were so flabbergasted, they thought I'd send them. I said, no. I said, you guys spoke the truth. And uh, they... Later that day, they asked permission to come to see me, and I talked to them, and they told me a lot of things. Quite interesting. They were in, in the Ethiopian War. So oh, really? Seven years they were in the Aramil together. Huh. Heard that captain again. That's the one from Seattle that was your yeah. friend. Okay. Okay. Did you guys ever hear of Forest Towns? I don't think I have. Yeah. Forest Towns was a high hurdle, a link of champion in the hurdles in 1936 in Germany. He was one of my captains. Here he is right here. The fellow on the, on the left here, there's Captain Riley, and there again is Captain Larson. Those were three so guys. Who were he same. was on the American Olympic team, and they... Yeah, and he won the high hurdle. High... Okay. Now, to show you how tall these guys were, Here's me between two of them. Huh. Huh. Okay. Before I built my uh, little home there in Africa, this is where I lived in North Africa for the first few months. Oh, that's pretty rough, wasn't it? <laughs> okay. All right, now, here's my motor pool sergeant, a little bit of guy, about five foot two tall. He was in charge of the motor pool. Okay. Now, 
here is the sergeant and that big guy there is six foot six Italian prisoner. We like a giant, and this guy, yeah. we had to order special shoes from 15 quadruple E. <laughs> that's what he's got in his, okay, I yeah, see and that. The sergeant, uh, he's got his, fit into his shoe. that's a shoe here. Oh. <laughs> Alright, now, when we're in Germany, in our defeated prison, we get these cauldrons, and we could cook enough food in one of those for 500 people. Yeah. They had them all over Germany and in the factories. Now, did you, uh, with your unit, were you armed at all? No. When, as you moved behind the front, you weren't armed at all? No. We, we had uh, we had a uh, company of Italian prisoners who were armed, all good shots, and they were our security. You had a, Italian prisoners that were armed? Yeah. With you. This is as you went through Europe? You through Europe, yeah. Had, <coughs> now, what kind of vehicles did you have? Oh, we had <coughs> We had a half track in our unit. But see, we were, we were pretty much protected in the back. I mean, we, yes. Uh, over in Africa, we got straight, but in, when, once we were in Germany, we never got strafed. Because you know, things were winding down by mm -hmm. that time. Right, right. That seems a little unusual that they would arm the prisoners, though, doesn't it? No, but those guys are good to know that the German soldiers were definitely afraid of them. They, they uh -huh. followed orders. Mm -hmm. So at that point, they were all pro American then? Well, I'll tell you, the average German soldier, he just was conscripted, he did, he was just told, and they didn't like the war, especially later on, they, they had all the home guard, a lot of old guys, I'll tell you about that later. Uh, I mean, uh, the only time we had trouble is we get, get involved some SS officers, and SS men, but those we shipped them another place quick. Mm -hmm. now, they were bad news. Now, in your movement across uh, Europe, were you ever aware of the concentration camps? The first thing we had found we were we were in uh, Worms, uh, Worms, Germany. No man. Uh, they brought in our camp a whole truckload of Italian prisoners. They were all like scouts, and then we were, it was uh, 366 of them, and 160 died. But after I said, Doctor, why are they dying? And I just gave up. These guys were like walking skeletons. They got some pictures of them, and uh, that's the first inkling we had of. Uh, but when I made these guys told us uh -huh. what they were like, but these guys working in the salt mine, they were just worked to death. But we didn't know. At that time, I didn't know anything about the big camps. Uh -huh. I wasn't in, in uh, Buchenwald uh -huh. when I went. I saw that. Where were you uh, when President Roosevelt died? In North Africa. Yeah, we were. We had guards all over on the port, all over the place. I didn't see them, but we were on the perimeter. We had guards all over the place. I knew he was there. But oh, when I, he came to visit yeah. North Africa. Okay. Where were you when he, you found out that he died? Uh, I was in Germany. Uh -huh. yeah. Did you have any feelings about that when you heard? No, we, we were quite concerned what was <coughs> going to happen, you know. Mm -hmm. Other pictures, I'll tell you about those and then we'll like that. No. Okay. okay, now I want to go back, I should have done to North Africa. After I got the Italian prison camp and everything was going good, one day this football, uh, full board colonel came, he says, Lieutenant, he says, you got a nice camp here. He says, I need 15 men for a, for an hour and hour setup. I said, well, fine. I said, you got a requisition? He says, no. He says, well, I says, I says, uh, Colonel, I got to have a requisition if I give you any of my men. I said, you get a requisition from Colonel Tapscott? Ah, he said, no, Lieutenant, you don't understand. He says, we can't put this on the record. I said, well, then you're not going to get the men. So he said to me, you know, I can impound your vehicles. I says, well, and they, I then I found he was the provo officer for the area. So since he threatened me, he's going to found my vehicles, I didn't send the men down to the port to work, 2,000 men. So Colonel says, man, tell you, where the hell are those men? I says, I can't send them down because I've been threatened to, to, uh, to, to impound my vehicles. He says, what are you talking about? Well, what i got to tell you, 
one of my sergeants who was a court stenographer, and every time I had an interview with any officer, remember I was only a second lieutenant, and these guys, you know. So he wrote everything, all the conversation down. So when I went down to the colonel, and he says, you sure? So I says, Sergeant Neal, I says, read back to the colonel what the guy said, and he threatened me. So they lost the labor of two shifts because I didn't send the men down. So that was that. I mean, you know, and you know, that day, and how I realized that when I was in, in the port there, uh, just, just about the time that I was in charge of the Italian prisoners, one of my buddies had graduated from officer school with me. So I said to him, What are you doing going home in only seven months? And I'm going home to be court martialed. I says, What the hell for? Well, he says, I did something I knew was wrong, but he says, I got an order from one of my higher ups and I did it. Of course, they left him out to dry. Well, he went back to the States, he wrote to me, and uh, he, he didn't get any, any uh, jail time, but he got dishonorable discharge. Mm. Before the end, war ended, the guy was a professor in a college in, in, in Iowa. He was the smartest guy in our class. Well, I mean, that's what we were up against, see? Mm -hmm. Well, that was going good. Well, then, remember now, I had 4,000 prisoners, and so I got the idea we were only about a half hour walk down the bank to the, to the Mediterranean. So I thought I had an idea. I got 500 of my prisoners, and I, I, I went down and checked it out. A little town I had to go through, and I talked to the people. So the men could go down and swim. It was a hell of a lot easier to have 500 men take a bath and try to bring water in the camp. So that was going fine. So one day, oh, about a month later, uh, in comes my 500 men with a Brigadier General. So I met the Brigadier I said, sir, can I help you? He says, I want to speak to the commanding officer. I says, that's me. No, 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 I want to speak to the man in charge. I says, sir, I'm the commanding officer. He says, where's your headquarters? I went over there, and uh, Lieutenant Pulaski, I said, Lieutenant, he says, the Major wants, to, or the General wants to know who's in charge. He says, well, you are. So he took out the orders and showed them. Well, he says, all right, Lieutenant, he says, I don't know why the Army is putting them, you know, a second lieutenant in, in an operation of this magnitude. So he says, you get those men properly dressed with the uniforms. Well, now, since these guys were working for us, they wore khaki like everybody else. The only thing you could tell they were prisoners, they had the boot with the Italian on their shoulder. Well, the general, I probably didn't know it anyway, so he says, no men go out of here until you are they're properly dressed. And then, in that time, the prison was dressed with blue denims, you know those hats, like a, but these guys weren't. You can tell them from the American soldier, actually. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so I went to uh, <coughs> quartermaster, and I said, I need 4,000 trousers, 4,000 jackets, no, 8,000. I said, you got to be kidding. I said, no, I got an order from the general right here. Well, he says, Lieutenant, he says, we haven't got that many, but if the general will sign the order, and then we'll tell him we haven't got them anyway. So I went back to the general. He wasn't there. In the meantime, I'm not sending the men down to the port to work, see. So there was one, two, still two shifts didn't go down. And again, the colonel called me and I went down and I told him, I says, and he couldn't believe it. So then the next day, uh, when I was out trying to get the um, general assigned the requisition, I got back to camp and the lieutenant Blosky said, Bill, he says, they've rescinded that order. I said, who? I said, nobody said we sent the order. I said, oh, wait a minute. So I went to see the general, and uh, the colonel there said, well, he said, that order's going to be sent it. I said, sir, by who? By whom? And uh, I, he says, well, he says, Lieutenant, while you're ahead, I, I advise you to go back to camp. I said, I'm going to go back to camp, but I'm not going to send any men down. So he said, wait a minute. So after 15 minutes, he came out with a paper. The order given by General so-and-so, to Lieutenant Mantagna, commander of Camp 151, that the order has been hereby rescinded and signed by the colonel, not by the general. So finally, when I went down to get my orders the next day, uh, and I, oh, another thing. When I used to go and get my orders, all the guys in charge of camp, they were all majors and lieutenant colonels and colonels, okay? So when I went in there, the MP said, you can't go in there, lieutenant. I said, why not? He, that's for all the uh, field officers. Yeah, but I'm in charge of the camp. He said, I don't care what you're in charge of. You're not going in there. So I told him, finally, the lieutenant came out. And finally, the 
colonel said, bring me in. And I said, no, have the colonel come out to see me. So he come out, I said, Colonel, this is not going to work. I says, well, he says, my fault, I should have notified him. Well, when I walked in there, you do ever feel that when you walk into a place like you're um, in the lion's den? I mean, when he introduced me here, I'm a second lieutenant in charge of the biggest camp. Well, anyway, so I'd go down and um, get my order. So after this incident, the next day he went down, he said, he said, okay, anybody got any questions? I says, Colonel, I got not a question, but I got something I want to say. So I told him what happened, and I says, Colonel, I said, maybe the general is right to put a second lieutenant in an operation of this magnitude. So I took off my bars and threw it on his desk as I resigned my commission. He said, come back here. I said, I've I'm I'm resigned my commission. So I went back to camp, and I said, I'll pack my gear and wait for further orders. Two hours later, he came, and, with his, uh, and he said, Lieutenant, you've got to stay on the job. He said, we're sorry about this. The general didn't, he didn't even know that these were workers down the port. I don't know. They had, they had more damn officers running around there than you could shake a stick at. Well, anyway, so I stayed, and uh, then I said to the uh, colonel, I said, you know, I heard that the class of 14, those of us who were left, have all been promoted to a captain. He said, no, I did, but we'll look into it. Well, nothing happened. So, but anyway, right after that, I mean, after 13 months, then it was sent us over uh, on the what, on the continent, and uh, went through that. So to follow up on that, <clears throat> when we got discharged, I was in charge of 40 men, and we would go to Fort Dixon. My job was to see that they were properly discharged and go. And then among that group was a warrant officer. He says, finally I've met you, he says, you were in charge of 150? I says, yeah. He says, what, what was with you and the general? He says, every time you came up for a captain promotion, he put you in the bottom of the list. Huh. That's why I never got my captaincy. Well, I got it later on anyway. But you see, I was bucking not only the air, but the brass. The brass. Now, when did you end up uh, going back to the States? I got home <clears throat> on uh, the 6th of November in 45. Um... When were you discharged? February 23rd, 46. Okay. Um, did you uh, ever use the GI Bill? No. How about the 5220 Club? No, I didn't use that either. Did you join any veterans organizations? Oh, yeah, the Legion. And uh, how about uh, staying in contact with anyone that was over with you? Well, Big George and a few other guys, but they're all gone now. Mm -hmm. yeah, and uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Hunter from Lebo, Kansas. Yeah, he, was, he was a doctor in our outfit. And Dr. Rubin, he, he passed on too now. How do you think your time in the service had a change or an effect on your life? Well, I don't know. I come back home. I was lucky, I guess. Well, of course, I... Uh, let me tell you something else that happened here. When the war ended, uh, we were in Ludwigshafen. Well, first of all, when we went into Germany... We're going to stop and go to another yeah, town. Let, let me... Okay, look. Yeah, you can see it in a circle. 
I should have. Well, I'll hold this up for. Did you focus on this before yeah. Wayne can no, focus? No, I didn't. Okay. So these are the camps you established, yeah. these circles. Where are the Vosges Mountains? That's northeastern. That's well, our, we were. Um, I'll tell you about the Sarberg. So we end up in Sarberg. No, we. That's a lot later. Sarberg. Uh, the Vosges Mountains in France. Yeah, it was an epinol. Got ahead of myself here. Okay. Yeah, and when we were in Epinal, uh, part of our outfit, we had an artillery unit there in this valley, and uh, part of our outfit and I was, was sent with them, and we were guard, we were protecting the artillery unit to guard this pass. So we spent two months there in the Vosges Mountains, and we slept in tents, sometimes in snow banks. We never got warm in 15 above zero and as much as 15, 20 below zero. So me and I had 30-some men, and we spent that time, and, you know, and the artillery has to be guarded because they have no way to protect them, so uh -huh. we were guarding these art artillery units. Okay. Well then, when we left there, we went to Sarberg, and we got to Sarberg in the middle of November. Okay, of 44. And uh, we set up camp there and we took over a French uh, garrison. It was a building there and the parade ground and buildings, the whole thing. And uh, so we, uh, and we, we had uh, 5,000 German prisoners in the holding camp there. Okay? Well, and as you, as you know, the Battle of Bulge started uh, December 16th, right? Uh -huh. And in the Sarberg we had a huge depot of uh, all kinds of stuff, uh, fuel, everything that the Army needed. And uh, the Severn Gap, uh, you, that's another, that's, this is between mountains coming down into Sarberg. Okay, are you familiar with the... Uh, where are you can see places over here. Well, anyway, the Severn Gap was a road down between these mountains, and we, we, the Germans thought we had a garden. It wasn't. They could have come down and taken us, but they went around us. They left us alone. And uh, when the Battle of Bulge started, we moved. They moved in the uh, 19th of Vac Hospital, and we were receiving uh, people right from the front. I remember one night we had 200 wounded prisoners come in there. And at the same time, we had 5,000 German prisoners in the area. Huh. Well, having all the prisoners, we, there was a, several German, we had a couple of German uh, surgeons that we, that we used. We, had, we, we received, believe it or not, a lot of German prisoners came in. And I forget that one night, we had 200, 200 wounded people come in there. Oh, did you have winter deer at all? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. What about the prisoners? Were, were they well? Well, yeah, a lot of them, the they came with their overcoats and everything else, yeah. Because mm -hmm. the building couldn't hold them all. We had them outside, and we'd go and bring a detail out to get wood, and we had barrels with they'd be outside. And uh, we'd try to, we'd try to feed them you know, two, two meals a day, so, mostly rations. We'd try to give them you know, hot coffee when we have it. Okay, when the Battle of Bulge started, it was the 16th of December, uh, it went on until about the end of February when this thing got cleared. There's a lot of stories in there. But one of the stories I want to tell you, you all know about the Battle of Bastogne, of course. The Battle of Bulge. Well, that affected everybody. And the biggest thing, you know, you, you must have read Patton, his trip up there. Mm -hmm. Well, who do you think followed Patton treating f with fuel and everything else? Us guys. And if you ever 
get a hold of two five-gallon cans of gasoline and throw them on the truck, you know what each one of them weighed? Fifty-five pounds? Mm. And you did that without gloves in your hand and whatever, and whatever it was? Well, just, that's what we went through, bringing up supplies and, and, and everybody, whether you're a cook or whatever you were, you were out there in the field following Pat and bringing the stuff up there. And man, that was hell. That was really hell. You didn't sleep. You well, you if you slept standing up, you'd fall down. That's for sure. That was a terrible thing, and uh, but luckily we made it. Did you ever see Patton? Yeah, that's almost. What did you think of him? Well, at the time, all I knew he was General Patton was a true yeah. pearl. Mm -hmm. no. did, yeah. Did you get to speak to him at all? Oh no. No, he'd be there. You know, he was quite a guy. You know, he don't you tell you pretty all about his story, you know. Alright, now, we got there and uh, so that the, um, when uh, Easter Sunday, the 13th of April, our outfit moved from Starburg into, uh, um, Worms, Germany, okay? Now, Worms, Germany, the, uh, that's when we had control of the skies and the war, the war was winding down, as you, as you, we knew that. And uh, uh, Eisenhower asked that the, the city be, they evacuate the city. And the uh, civilians left, but the SS outfit decided to stay there. So Eisenhower sent over 500 bombers and they leveled that city in 35 minutes. There was nothing left standing, and in the stars and stripes I got someplace, there wasn't a wall high enough that a dog couldn't piss over. Huh. And they left the Lutheran church in the hospital with a lot of German wounded in there. And uh, we received 30,000 prisoners that gave up. In, in, uh, and then we started shipping them down to, to France. And then from there we were sent to Ludwigshafen where we set up this camp of 185,000 German prisoners, uh, there were Russian slaves, all kinds of people. We sorted them out. And uh, then finally, after the war ended in early June, we were relieved and we were supposed to go home. Our outfit, we've been over all this time. Well, we never got to go home right away quick. We got to Reims and they put us in charge of prisoners and we were rehabilitating equipment to go to Japan. So we were there from then until the, the bomb was dropped in Japan. And of course, then it was all a chaos. Anyway, to make a long story short, I didn't get home until the 6th of November. And I didn't get charged until the 23rd of February. Well then, one more thing happened there. I gotta show you this and I'll tell you, tell you the rest of it. Are you talking on this? Yes. Mm -hmm. Here's one of the pictures of, of the 185, 1945, yeah, 185,000 prisoners. Looked like Coney oh, Island, right? I think that was in um, Epinal. You're carrying a 45 there, huh? Yeah, yeah, that's okay. pretty much on our own there. There's another picture of all of the POWs. Ended, and we were relieved. We were sent to Reims to go home. And that was early June. Well, again, because I spoke the language, spoke French, we were taken prisoners to Nuremberg. 
And I made two trips taking German officers and the SS to Nuremberg. I didn't know anything about the trial. All I knew was took them to Nuremberg. And on the third trip, I said to the Major, come on, Major, send somebody else. I'm going to go home in a few days. By the 29th of June, I'm supposed to have been home. Oh, I said, you'll be back in a couple of days. Well, I got back uh, the 6th of August. I'll tell you what happened. Yeah, we go into Nuremberg, and we stopped for a release stop. We pulled off the side of the road, and it was fine. We had a guy relieve themselves and give him something to eat. And we pulled out the back wheel of that weapons carrier, hit a tank mine. Killed the two MPs. The driver got pinned under the truck, and they found me by the side of the road three hours later. So I spent from the, uh, I think it was the 9th of June until the 6th of August in, in body cast. Now, did you receive a Purple Heart for that? No. Nope. Because that it was after related. the war. You believe that? Hmm. It wasn't war related. Yeah. The war had ended. I didn't even get any compensation for it either. I got 10% disability. Yeah, I had a busted knee, broken foot. My shoulder was separated. By this hand here, you can see all the... My thumb was, anyway, and uh, I got out of, the, they took the cast off just two days before they dropped the bomb in Japan. It was the 4th, 4th of August, they dropped the bomb on the 6th of August, and they yelled. Hmm. <clears throat> now, are you young aware that uh, when the war was over, if you had eight points, they could, you could go home? Yes. Right. Well, I had 12 points in almost in the, the total amount. So when I went to see after I got out of the hospital there in the war, you know, the war in Japan, I went to see this, um, uh, was a major general, and I says, Major, I says, I think I'm entitled to go home. So when I showed him, he said, my God, boy, he says, you've been here, yes, yeah, right from the beginning. So he says, okay, we'll get you on the next uh, group going home. Well, he did, and we went to La Harve. In the meantime, the merchant marines went on a strike until we were sleeping on the ground for 30 more days. <laughs> Finally I got home to Fort Dix and uh, since my records had gone ahead of me because I was in the hospital, they let me come home and they, I went back the 14th of August and finally got discharged by the 23rd. Huh. So. Now, to show you, we did have some good times. Uh, after we were relieved, we waited a week before we could be transferred to uh, Ludwig, uh, to uh, Reims, uh, I gotta show you a picture here. You'll get a kick out of this. Short right here. Now, this fellow's a chimney sweep. He's a young fellow. And over there, you know, you burn coal, so you use a chimney sweep. And when I talk about him, okay, uh, we talked him out of his hat, and we gave him enough stuff that he was very happy to get hat. So here we are with Captain Hudnut. We were, we had a week time there, and where we had a party, we uh, were able to get all kinds of liquor and everything else. <laughs> So Captain Hudnut and I, we're in charge of the party for the whole week. <laughs> okay. He stayed with military government for three years after the war. Okay. He was in Buffalo. Wow. He had a handlebar mustache. He was quite a thing. Quite a guy. Did you ever stay in contact with him at all? Oh yeah, up until he died here a few years ago. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, why don't you, I guess, turn it off and then we'll do that. All right. I was, I was going to, I didn't know, you're not finished yet? I didn't know if you were finished? No, I, I just want to tell you one more okay. incident that happened. Yeah, here we were in a balcony, and you look at Captain Hudson, he was feeling pretty good there. <laughs> See up there, up. I guess so, it looks it. There was quite a party for that whole week. <laughs> Sorry. Now when the war was winding down, 
it was in late February. Since we missed Christmas and all that, our outfit with these, these 20, I think had 28 men and five officers, we were in this um, uh, French, it was in, uh, it was in, um, on the starboard road. Well. Starboard. Well, anyway, uh, when they moved the Vec Hospital in there, and uh, we're, so we thought we'd have a party, and we invited the nurses and the doctors from the hospital, because the hospital was kind of winding down. And uh, so I went over there to invite them to our, for a party. We did list of men, had a couple of parties. We thought the officers should have one. And uh, so the girls were very happy to be invited. And then when the girl walked in, Captain Tiny, six foot four, the biggest girl I ever saw in my life. She was a giant. So I said, you're going to come to dance? No, she says, I don't want to go dance with you little guys. I like to look in the eyes of a man when I'm dancing out over his head. So I said to her, if you come to the dance, I guarantee you don't have to stand on your tippy toes to look into my captain's eyes. So she came to the party. Well, we had the party from 4 to 7 and 7 to 10 because they all couldn't come at the same time. So, But I didn't tell her that the other three officers, Reuben, uh, Riley, and Towns, were also 6 foot 4, 6 foot 7. So she stayed for the entire <laughs> party. Well, that was quite a thing. Well, then... And when I had taken these prisoners to Nuremberg, and we, I got blown out of the thing, I ended up in the hospital. When I woke up in the morning, they had me in the cast, and, the, the, and here's another thing. A major who was in the Army from Honeyway Falls and a nurse were there, and she said, Bill, which one of the boys are you? And I said, well, I'm Bill. And she said, well, we know your brother. We don't remember you. Well, I said, anyway, that's who I am. So the girl said, well, we can't move him. We better get Tiny in here to help us. So I was so groggy, you know, I heard the name Tiny, so they moved me and so so about, about noon time, Tiny came in, the other girls, and I say, Tiny, I says, were you in Sarberg with the 19th of Vac Hospital? She says, yeah. I says, uh, I remember you were invited to a dance, and you didn't want to go until you told her the story. She says, how do you know about this? Well, tell me, was that true that you were there? She says, yeah. Well, how do you know all about this? So I said, I'm the little lieutenant that invited you. I'd like that for a story. <laughs> so did she take good care of you? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah when I left there because I went, she said, you're crazy, Bill, you ought to stay here. Well, I went back, you know, to Reims because our office was going to go home. Of course, when the, when the uh, bomb dropped, it was hell. I, I didn't get to go home, see. I could have stayed there, sure. I went through hell for this from that time on. Huh. Yeah, I was there. You better believe I was having good treatment. <laughs> <laughs> well, we had to... Uh, Take a, a shot of your picture in the other room. Yeah. Okay. okay. Why don't you tell the story of this drawing and, and okay. the frame? When I was 25 years old and in, in, in charge of the prisoner camp, uh, one of the prisoners carved the frame and another one uh, painted my picture and they gave it to me as my 25th uh, birthday present. And that frame was one long piece of wood. The gentleman laid it all out. And he carved it, and then when he sawed it, and, 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 and you can see how the miters went together. And the eagle up there is what you see in the, the, the back of a half, American half dollar. Now this is all mahogany. You all said. mahogany, yeah. And uh, I bought that piece of wood for two packs of cigarettes in the part of our inn. I never smoked, so I always had cigarettes. Mm -hmm. I'd so say it was money well spent. So this was in 1944 that this was done. No, no, no. It was, uh, oh. 40, 43. 43, I'm sorry, okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, thank okay. you very well, thank much. You. Thank you.